So, uh, okay, let's get started. Um, welcome, I hope you all had a good weekend. Um, I tried to, uh, I changed things up a little bit, because I know there were some issues with the things being all blurry on the video last time. I think I figured it out, so, uh, but let me know if, if it looks like crap. All right. Um, uh, so, I don't know, something with Zoom <clears throat> downscaling things in or in an incorrect way i'm not really sure so uh okay so that's number one um and yeah so we got the the midterm coming up all right um hope you guys are pumped about that uh hope you're looking at the review problems okay um and uh yeah so but but uh i think um for office hours First of all, my office hours, I think, are cursed. There's something about them that's cursed. Because last week, I, I, was, I came on and my Wi-Fi just, like, blew up immediately when I tried to connect. Um, but one of the second years actually showed up. He was just, like, he couldn't get enough the first year. He wanted to come back uh, for, uh, for a little reverie. Um, so that was fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, so but I think this week, given that the midterm is going to be ongoing at that time, uh, it might... I, th I think it's probably not a good idea to have office hours because it's like you'll be there and like talking, but like you aren't supposed to talk to each other. So it's going to be kind of awkward. I think if we did office hours. Um, so, but if you have questions, I mean, we're, we're going to have class today and we're going to have class on Thursday. So, I mean, if, if you, we can essentially treat Thursday's class like office hours if you want. Okay. So if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm happy to take as much time as it needs to, to answer all of those. Okay. Um, so we're, we're kind of in, in review mode now anyway. So, um, yeah. Okay. So that's the, the first part of the plan. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is I was thinking I could do, um, a practice problem myself, if you want to, uh, just to let's see how things are going. Okay. Um, and there's, there's kind of two problems that I was, I don't think I'm, I'm just going to do one. There's sort of two that I'm, I'm entertaining. Okay. One is on thinking about human capital accumulation. Okay. So, um, it's a little bit, uh, you know, you did a little bit stuff with human capital or with labor at least, right. Where you did, where you, on the, the last one where you had, uh, uh, a choice of labor and that, um, there was some labor, labor leisure trade off there. Right. So here, um, it's going to be more of a human capital decision. If we do this problem, uh, we're building up human capital over time. Um, and then, uh, steadily, uh, it, it'll start to depreciate, but you can build it up much like regular capital. Um, and then that will give you some income and it's going to be sort of a Ramsey style problem from there, from then on. Okay. Um, and you can save and everything like that. So, so it adds in a new state variable basically. Um, and then the other one we could do is, uh, like a climate problem. Okay. Which is basically, it's just adding in another state variable as well. Okay. So you, you're going to, it'd be a situation where, uh, your production produces emissions at a certain rate. Those emissions, um, go into a stock of carbon in the atmosphere, which we'll model in a very simple way, uh, actually pretty much the same, same way we model everything, you know, you have a flow in depre uh, proportional depreciation. Okay. Uh, but that, um, that stock of carbon has negative effects on, in this case, pro productivity, basically. Um, that's an, you know, it could have negative effects on a lot of things, but we're going to, we'll say it goes through the productivity channel. Um, and then sort of like figure out what, what do you do? Okay. Um, or, or in that, in that case we would, um, Yeah, so so in that one we would be doing more of like a social planners problem, okay? But um, you can imagine decentralizing it too, okay? So I don't know. Do you guys have preferences on human capital versus climate? Um, yeah, 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 pretty much. Um, Mm-hmm. Yep. 
you're partial to the equilibrium one versus social planner. Yeah. Okay. Others. Human capital versus climate. What's it going to be? Climate. Oh, we got a, we got some conflict here. Sort of, maybe, conditionally. Uh, climate, all right. You're in a tropical region. You're going to get hit hard by this climate externality. A coconut tree might not survive. Um, all right, okay. We got two for climate, one for human capital. Well, it's, a, it's strategic now. If you're happy with the current situation, then I guess you can just let it ride. Okay, let's do the climate one. Okay, sorry, Garrett. Uh, you'll you'll enjoy this. Don't worry, you'll love this. Okay. Um. All right. So. Uh. Okay. Um. Yeah. All right. Now. Now this one. You know, there's many different ways you can set this up. I tried to do it, and this is a. This is an old problem that I. I think it might have been a test. I'm not really sure. Uh, I think it might have been a midterm actually. Um. I. I I gave it out. Um, I'm gonna, I changed it up a little bit actually when I was thinking about it last night because I realized that you can make it a little bit simpler. Okay. Um, so at the end of the day, we're going to get almost a closed form kind of thing. We'll get something that we can kind of grasp at what the what the outcome is going to be. Okay. Um, all right. So let me arrange my effects here. Okay. Um, it works. Okay. Yeah, my green screen is not what it used to be. You can see the green. I changed my parents' came, so I got I did move rooms, which means the lighting situation is not as good, etc. But you know, um, I was it's it's legible. Okay, you can still see in the area behind my head, so we should be good. Um, okay, so so we're gonna do this this uh, climate externality. Okay. All right. Um, if we have time at the end, I'm going to do the, do, do more of the programming stuff. Okay. But, um, this is of course going to take much longer than, than I anticipate then. Yeah. So it, it might take a while, but we'll see. Um, okay. So, so what's going on with this climate externality kind of going to keep everything as standard as possible. Okay. Um, and in particular, okay. Uh, what are we gonna have? Well, all right. So, so we need to think about what 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 are our state variables? Okay. Okay, our state's gonna be capital, and what I'm gonna call S, which is sort of indicative of the stock of, of carbon. Okay, I didn't use C because that's already consumption. Okay, uh, so those are gonna be F state variables. Those are the things that are gonna be moving around over time. Okay, capital we're gonna keep real simple, like. Okay, and this this I'm I'm kind of jumping direct to social planner here. Okay, so so we're just um we're just playing social planner today. All right, uh, we we didn't do that much in our world of continuous time with the full on social planner, so maybe this is good just to make sure we understand. So social planner is kind of easy ish. All right, um, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna just write F K uh for output. Okay, so. Social plan area is going to get some output. All right. No population growth, but we will have depreciation. Okay. And then consumption. Okay. So what, what I'm saying here is uh, the, the law of motion for capital is basically investment, which confusingly is F of K minus C. So it's the first and the third term output net of consumption minus depreciation. Okay. So what I'm saying, uh, in other words, this is very standard capital law of motion we we just jump straight to uh per capita terms okay so uh that's just gonna be just like we always see all right there's just that we have no population growth so there's no little end term uh modifying the depreciation okay um all right so that's standard okay and then the uh the law of motion for the carbon stock okay so that's non-standard conceptually but it's gonna look similar all right now, there's many ways in which you can think about the uh, the carbon stock evolving, okay? Both in terms of the uh, the climate science, as it were, and in terms of the, how does it connect up with the economic side, okay? Um, 
So in terms of the climate science, uh, you know, emissions, carbon emissions um, do uh, go into the atmosphere. We know that. Um, and they do mix relatively quickly. Okay, so uh, local carbon emissions are not a very local pollutant. Okay, uh, if you emit carbon in the U.S., it'll spread about around the world pretty quickly. It'll equilibrate, that's to say, um, same carbon emitted in China or wherever. Okay, so uh, versus other things, man, by the way, China uh, got really hit hard by some uh, that PM 2.5. Um, hope you guys are okay. Stay inside, got your air filters running. Um, but that, you know, like a PM 2.5 particulate matter is, is localized and it, it gets emitted somewhere and it moves, but it sort of falls out of the atmosphere. Okay, so so we're dealing with something that's are inherently global, first of all. Okay. Um, and uh, it does come out of the atmosphere, right? There's a cycle, the carbon cycle uh, from like trees. Uh, it equilibrates with the oceans and things like that. Okay. Now, some of there's a good chance that some carbon that goes in stays in for a very long time. Okay, so it it's not going to look exactly what I'm going to write here, but this is our first approximation. So what we're gonna what I'm going to write is let me just write it out and I'll tell you how I'm, how I'm thinking about it. There's an in, inflow and an outflow. The outflow I'll do first. Tau times s is just a depreciation type thing. It's just like the delta, the tau and delta are analogous. Those are proportional depreciation. A certain fraction of the carbon stock comes out of the uh, the atmosphere over time. Okay, now that's that's a thing. That's an approximation because the lag is actually kind of variable, and some of it is thought to stay for quite a while. But we're going to just do a proportional uh, kind of thing, All right? And then how does it get in? Well, it gets emitted, right? Um, and how much gets emitted? Well, that depends on uh, how much. In this case, we're going to assume it depends on how much economic activity there is. Okay, I'm writing k. You might think, oh, well, let's write E times F of K. Let's do a proportional to output, okay? And you can do that. It's a little bit more complicated for various reasons. I'm going to write K. So it's like, if you have a factory, um, it emits stuff. F of K really is about decreasing returns, saying that, you know, the, the next factory you have is for some reason less productive or something like that, okay? Uh, or it's, it's put in a less productive area. There's decreasing returns. That's more on how much you produce. In terms of emissions, if you put a factory in a crappy location, Still going to emit a lot. It's, it might not be productive as, as productive, but it's still going to emit the same amount. Okay, so that's why I'm thinking K is a little better, and also it actually works out slightly better in terms of the algebra. Okay, um, but that's a design decision. There's no obvious answer. I, I would say right right off the bat. Okay, but we just in the background though, what you do see is um, carbon emissions do track very closely to uh, um, output. Okay, because uh, well, the main one of the main components of carbon emissions is energy production, and energy production tracks very closely with output. Okay, so this is like the the Chinese premier Li Keqiang is. I think this is one of his like internal laws. He's like, you know, if you want to if you want to know about output, actually just look at energy usage. If if you're not measuring output perfectly, you can just look at energy usage, and that's a good proxy. Okay, um, and that's true. It is a good proxy. Um, in the U.S., actually, it's been breaking down a little bit because of uh, uh, a certain efforts towards uh, energy efficiency. Okay, so if you increase energy efficiency, that allows you potentially to increase output without increasing emissions, okay? And that's kind of what you see in the US. But also what you see in the US is um, uh, outsourcing. Okay, so you see outsourcing of, of polluting industries. So it's kind of cheating in some sense. If you, you take a polluting industry and you, you Per, you move it somewhere else and then just import those goods, the, the emissions are still happening and they're still coming back to you. It's just, they're not going to be recorded as happening in your country. Right. So that's part of the the story there is um, essentially the, the exporting of, of emissions. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. But so, so that's, that's kind of a side note, but uh, so that's, um, that's our law of motion for, for the carbon stock. Okay. And if you think about um, if you're, you're a social planner, okay. You're, you're, you're saying, okay, well, am I going to, I can invest more, right? And if I invest more, I kind of get like F prime. I get the, a little bit more, uh, output. Okay. Um, but I produce more capital. Okay. Which, uh, is going to produce more emissions, this factory through, through this proportion, um, 
E, okay, here, let me figure out where I'm pointing. Uh, this proportion E uh, is gonna produce, in the long run, more carbon in the, in the, the atmosphere. Okay, now what I haven't told you is what, what's the actual import of having that carbon in the atmosphere, okay? Uh, and that's gonna come in through our production function. So I'm gonna just give it right in, term, in per capita terms again. Uh, the production function is gonna look like this, one minus gamma times S times FK. All right, so more carbon stock means less output. Obviously, you can go negative. Let's just suppose that we never hit that. Okay, let's suppose we're in a region where things are potentially bad, but not like we hit zero. You could do a max of zero in that if you want, and that would be a sort of catastrophic, you know, outcome at zero, right? But uh, we're gonna imagine we're still we're we're staying way within the range of like, you know, not cataclysmic uh, losses. Okay. Um, all right. So then that completes the story. Now, okay, you 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 get a little bit more capital. You get F prime in terms of pure product production, kind of net present valued. Um, but then you also lose. Um, well, you pick up factors along the way. You, you through E gets you from capital to carbon stock. Gamma gets you from carbon stock to 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 damage. Okay, so so like on the plus side, you get F prime of K. On the minus side, you're basically going to get like E times gamma times F of K, right? So you get a little bit more capital, which means you get E more carbon stock, which means you get gamma more proportional damages, but, but because they're proportional, you have an F of K there, okay? Um, and so that's going to be your net net loss, okay? So that's those are, those are the forces. Those are the choices you're going to be navigating as a social planner, okay? Um, all right, so that's all sort of trying to get a little bit of intuition, okay? But we can just write out the um, Hamiltonian and, and, and solve it, okay? And go from there. Uh, yeah, all right, so this this gets a little complicated, right? But um, the Hamiltonian itself is not that complicated, actually. But but solving it gets a little bit more complicated than is, is what we usually do, but we're going to kind of slog through it, all right? So um, what do we got? Uh, all right, so so remember our state is K and S. I didn't write, I guess, our, our choice. Oh, we're gonna write it. Our choice somewhere else. Our choice, I'm just gonna have be C because C nets out from output and gives you investment, which tells you about the evolution of the capital stack. Um, and you kind of, you know everything if you know C in terms of the evolution, okay? Um, all right, so then our Hamiltonian is U of C. Plus, um, okay, so, oh, when I, sorry, when I, when I wrote down the, the capital law of motion, I should have just written Y here, okay, because that Y should also include this damage here. This is, this I'm going to call the damage function or something, D, all right, that, that Y should include D, and that, that should be the same Y that goes into this uh, law of motion for capital here, okay, so I should have written Y minus C minus delta K. So that's a general form for this, okay? Um, otherwise, everything else I said is, is the same, okay? Nothing really changes. It's just we, we have to make sure we account for D, okay? All right, so, um, okay, so now mu, all right? Mu is gonna be our standard uh, uh, Hamiltonian multiplier thing uh, on, on the capital evolution, okay? And that's gonna be one minus gamma S F of K minus Delta K minus C, right? So that's just K dot, right? I, I wrote out, I subbed in for Y, okay? Um, and then uh, we need another multiplier. I'm gonna call it Lambda for the carbon stock, which is also evolving endogenously, okay? So that's gonna be E times K minus tau times S, all right? So that's gonna be our Hamiltonian, all right? Um, So we want to optimize that, okay? All right at the end of the page, that's awkward. Um, I bet you there's a way to like copy stuff in this program, but I don't know what it is. Mm. Come on, man, let me copy stuff. I think this is it. 
This is probably just going to be a dotted line, which is cool, but not what I wanted. Oh, maybe it's not. Okay. Copy. You see that? I'm evolving. Um, paste. Okay, there, there we go. All right, so I copied that over to the next side. I call that a success. All right, so, uh, okay, now we have more room to like do our optimization. Okay. Um, all right, so now uh, we're gonna just go through, apply the rules that we know and love, um, and hopefully get to an answer. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, okay, we got, remember we got two state variables, one choice variable. So we're gonna get one sort of standard FOC, which is gonna look actually exactly the same as before. And then we're going to get two state evolution equations, one for each state, okay, and, and associated multiplier, okay. So uh, we get so the first condition one is that HC equals zero, okay. So I'm going to write zero equals HC, which is equal to U prime of C. Just scan for C's, and all we have, the only other thing we have is mu, right? So that's exactly the same. As we usually have, that just means that mu is equal to u prime of c, that mu tracks the marginal utility of consumption as usual. Okay, so that's good. Not everything has changed. All right. Uh, number two. Okay, number two is going to be uh, reminiscent of our capital uh, evolution number four, but we're going to pick up an extra term from some stuff. All right. Um, and particularly, we're going to pick up how the capital change the carbon stock. Okay. Carbon stock goes into future production sort of indirectly. So the, the direct effect though is going to be changing the carbon stock. Okay. So uh, I, I'm going to write that like this. I'm going to write so rho times mu minus mu dot is equal to HK, which we're going to compute here. All right. So what is HK? Uh, well, it's, it's mu times one minus gamma S F prime of K. All right, and then minus delta. So you can see we have that f prime of k minus delta as as before. This is an s here, but we also had that damage term one minus gamma s throwing a, throwing a wrench into things. Okay. Um, all right. So this is this is all standard, and then we're also going to pick up. If you look at the Hamiltonian, there's a k and the uh, the evolution of the carbon stock. Okay, so we're going to pick up lambda times e. And it's linear in k. All right. So that's, why it's a little easier to do linear k. Okay. All right, so that's what we get. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and uh, everything else drops out for k. All right, um, let's just leave that as it is for now, okay? Next one is the same thing, but for lambda, which is our multiplier associated with uh, the carbon stock, okay? That's gonna be h of s. We're taking the derivative, we take the derivative with respect to the state variable itself, right? Um, Okay, and, and where, where does S show up? Okay, well, we're gonna get minus mu gamma F of K. So that's sort of that incremental damage in terms of output associated with more carbon stock. Okay, and then we're gonna get just this depreciation term. So that's gonna be minus lambda tau S, which is analogous to, uh, sorry, there's no S. Um, tau minus lambda tau, which is analogous to a, a capital style HH. Okay. Um, all right, so that's, that's good. Um, the question is, how do we proceed? All right, so this is where things get a little tricky. Um, but, you know, usually what we do is we try and turn, we want to eliminate the multipliers, right? Uh, so we turn things into growth rates and, and things like that. Okay, so let's try and let's try and go down that road and we'll see how how far it gets us. All right. So let's turn the um these number two and three equations here into uh, multipliers and see if that can if that if that's anything. All right. Um I guess uh yeah. He's got to be careful about our, our minus signs. Okay. Um, so let's start with two. Okay. We want to get like, you know, mu dot over mu. What's mu dot over mu going to be? Um, all right. So most of the mu's are going to cancel. Okay. So we're going to get, um, let me 
the shillings going to be? Yeah, okay, uh, minus one minus gamma s. Let me write down what I think this is going to be. Plus, and then uh, plus rho, and then uh, minus. Okay, so in in sum, basically, you know, we're we're going to pick up these proportional terms. With a minus sign, so one minus gamma s f prime of k, a delta here, which is with the minus sign of the plus delta. Right, this is proportional to the rows. So we're going to get a plus rho, and then we're going to get this thing divided by mu. So I'm, t I'm taking this thing and dividing by mu, right, and then rearranging. Okay, now when you divide this by mu, you get a lambda over mu. Okay, so it, it's if it weren't for this last term, it'd be kind of friendly. Right, but then we have this last term, which is like lambda over mu. Okay, so it's the ratio of those uh, Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so it's saying how kind of how how important is the carbon stock relative to the capital stock? Okay, and maybe that tells you how to trade those off. Okay, um, so that's a clue. All right, and then for three, going from equation three, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to try and look at that growth rate. Okay. So uh, this is also we're going to get kind of a ratio here, but but we, what you're going to end up with is, um, you know, you're going to get basically gamma f of k times mu over lambda, okay, plus tau, and then uh, plus rho. Okay, so the the tau and rho are, are kind of the same. They're sort of depreciation discounting stuff that that's always proportional. Okay, um, but then that first term again, you have a ratio of these Lagrange multipliers. Okay, this time it's flipped, but but it's it's that the ratio of those Lagrange multipliers. Okay, um, okay, and so now you know from here, mm, th this is this step is a bit tricky, but what we're going to do is basically define a new parameter, a new variable. Okay, which is the ratio of those two multipliers, because we're going to be able to find the growth rate of that thing. Only in terms of itself, and because of because of the way we express these two terms here. Okay, so let's let's define triple equals x. Let's let's have it be um, minus lambda over mu. Confusingly, because uh, because uh, mu is mu is good. Okay, mu is good because capital is good for the most part. Uh, lambda. It, it, mu is positive rather because capital is good. Uh, lambda is negative because because the carbon stock is actually bad, right? It's, it hurts us purely, um, so it's going to be a negative number. So that's why I'm putting a negative here to make x be a positive number. I don't really have to do that, but I'm going to do it. All right. So um, yeah. Uh, okay. So then. Let me think here one second. No, we don't, we don't, let's not make a negative. That's confusing. Let's just do the straight up ratio. Okay, lambda over mu, that's what it is, all right? Um, okay, and so this means that just a basic law of growth rates, that growth rate of that thing is gonna be the growth rate of lambda minus the growth rate of mu, okay? Um, and that's a thing that we can kind of, we can just plug in, all right? Okay, so just just plugging in those those equations above, except we want to kind of sub in x when we can. All right, so from that lambda growth rate, we get gamma f of k, and then this is this is actually one over x, right? Because we're defining x as lambda over mu, so this is one over x. Okay, and then plus tau plus rho. Okay, uh, that's the lambda part, and then minus mu dot over mu. Okay, so then we're going to get, well, that's that's going to be a plus 1 minus gamma s. And I'm going to, I'm going to call that d, the damage function. Okay, so d equals minus gamma s, because I don't want to keep writing it. Uh, d, f of k. All right, and then minus delta minus rho, and then plus e times x. So e, and then this is now x, that's lambda over mu. Okay, so we wanna be careful, 
All right. Um, with which way the ratio goes. Okay, but but I think we got it. Um, and so then, well, some stuff cancels. Most doesn't, but the rows are going to cancel. So that's a step. Uh, plus row and minus row in that big equation there. Okay, so what are we left with? Well, we're going to be left with, let's collect terms. Tau minus delta. So we have a tau here. The rows cancel. And then we have tau minus delta. Okay, so that's like the difference in terms of depreciation because this is a differential. All right. And then we're going to get plus gamma. This is now just collecting terms, most of which relate to x. Uh, plus d prime k and then plus e times x. Okay, so that's our that's our equation there. Um, okay. Now, this is fairly complicated. Okay, uh, we might need to make some simplifications to to proceed. Okay, I I would have. In the problem, if this is a problem, I would have told you. I would have told you a lot of stuff, but I, in particular, I would have told you what simplifications I want you to make, or even better, I would have just made them right up front. Okay, so <clears throat> to one thing we can see is that the tau delta differential. If we got rid of that, that might help us. Okay, so we're gonna. I'm just gonna assume, and this is a pretty big ask, but I'm gonna assume that tau equals delta. That the carbon stock and the capital stock depreciate at the same rate. Okay, there's no reason why that would necessarily be true but it's gonna help us get some analytic stuff going here. Okay, um, so those two depreciation rates are equal. Okay, so that, that kills off one term. Not a bad day's work. Okay, and then we're, le we're left with these things. So these are kind of, kind of funky. Um, all right, um, and remember this, this, is, this is x dot over x. Okay, and then, man, how did I do this? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So then, okay. So th this kind of simplifies things, all right? In the sense that now we have X evolving, right? First, so we, we sort of reduced it from two Lagrange multipliers to one. Okay. So if we wanted to talk about the, uh, the dynamics in the system, we could potentially do that. Okay. And we'd have one less state variable to deal with. All right. Um, and then because, sorry, because we could talk about the dynamic of, dynamics of x and then sort of map that into to mu and into lambda and everything like that. Okay. So, um, all right. Now, uh, that, that, that's kind of all we can do for the dynamics. Okay. Um, we may want to think about steady state though. All right. Um, because, you know, like with, with Renzi, I mean, we, we can't really do that much in the dynamics. We can we can draw pictures and such, but but we can't really do that much. Okay, so at the end of the day, if we want to get some closed form stuff or at least interpretable stuff, we're probably gonna to have to, to restrict to steady state. Okay, so let's let's do that. Okay, so now when we go in the steady state, all right, um we're gonna get basically a value well we're going to be able to solve for our different things like we're going to be able to solve for x basically and then and then sort of plug that in uh use um steady state condition for capital and for the carbon stock and get something so 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 the conditions that we have available are now basically i mean everything being zero the carbon uh you know the uh Mu's not moving, lambda's not moving, um, capital's not moving, and the carbon stock's not moving. Okay, those are those are our main conditions. Okay, um, 
And then from there, we can kind of back out what the values of those things are. Okay, so um, let's see. All right, so unfortunately, we have to go back up and, and, and look at these. Here we go. We, we, actually, we actually just are going to use these conditions at the top. Okay, so um, first, what is what, what is steady state? Okay, so in, in this case, things are fairly bounded. Okay, the world is is fairly bounded. We're not we don't have long term growth, um, so we're going to converge to some fixed level of capital, some fixed level of output, and for that reason, the, these Lagrange multipliers aren't going to go haywire. They're not going to go up to infinity or, or whatever. They're they're just going to converge to numbers. Okay, so then. Um, sort of an assertion on my part, but but you know because everything is bounded, these little round multipliers should converge to, to fixed numbers, meaning their growth rates are going to be zero. Okay. So if you if you if you look at equation number two up at the top there, okay, you know, in the steady state, that's going to give us zero is equal to minus D. Remember I'm calling that one minus gamma S, I'm calling that D for now. Although we do want to remember that it's it's endogenous. Um F prime of K plus delta plus rho minus e, you remember that's x, e times x, all right? Okay, and then um, second equation, okay? Uh, so this is, this is, this is from number two. This is from number three, stationarity, okay? It's gonna say that zero, equal to gamma f of k times one over x and then plus um so here again tau is equal to delta so we're gonna have tau plus rho okay so that's coming off equation number three so we're gonna have delta plus rho okay so I, th this tau becomes the delta okay so now um all right now how do we we let me, let me, uh, there's one step, which I've sort of forgotten. I need to think about it for a second. So we need to, we basically want to solve for X. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, okay. We want to solve for X. All right. And we can do that actually. Okay. We can do that from the, this equation here if we want. Right, we can just subtract and, and solve for x. Okay, and remember x x is going to be negative because lambda is negative and because s is bad. S is a bad uh, car carbon stock is a it's a bad thing. All right. Okay, so um, from that third equation being zero, okay, that's going to mean that x is basically well, it's going to be you know gamma f of k over delta plus rho. Okay, so subtract uh, delta plus rho, kind of cross multiply. X is going to be gamma f k over delta plus rho. Okay. Um, and so from there, okay, then you can plug that in to the other equation and get something characterizing k, right? Because I guess I should have said this earlier. These two equations, basically, they have the unknowns are x and k. So they have two equations, two unknowns. We don't know that Lagrange multiplier ratio, and we don't really know uh, the capital stock. Okay. Um, yeah, it should, yeah, it should be minus. Oops. There we go. Yeah. So that's my you subtract that delta minus rho. You get that minus. Okay, so that and that makes sense because we expect x to be negative, right? And everything else there is positive. Okay. Um, all right, so we solve with we solve for x like kind of in terms of k, all right? Um, and then we can plug in there, and then we're we're gonna get something. Okay. All right, so we're gonna plug in this x now to this number two equation. Okay. Shoop. All right, so here we're gonna get zero is equal to minus d f prime of k plus delta plus rho. Um, and then, uh, you know, E gamma F of K delta plus rho. 
Okay. Actually, I didn't come to think of it. <clears throat> that whole tau equals delta thing may have been pointless. I apologize for that. That may have, like it helped us get that x that equation, but that actually, we don't, we don't really need that. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think it was pointless. Let's, let's go back and undo that. Sorry guys. Um, I just kind of want to know what the, what the effect is. Cause Remember we, when we went from equation number three, we, we swapped out that tau. So let's just let's just unswap that. Okay, so that's a tau. Okay, and that means that this is a tau, and that means that that's a tau down here where we subbed in. Okay. All right, that's bad. Okay. Um. All right. So now, for the long last. We're, we're, we almost have something that actually looks familiar, okay? We've traveled through the wilderness for a while here, okay? But I think we're going to get something that looks relatively familiar, okay? And then we're going to try and interpret it, right? So, uh, but let me rearrange this, okay? I'm going to rearrange it into uh, rho plus delta is going to, uh, say, rho plus delta plus E gamma. I'm going to make it so that, like, we only have things plusing. I don't like minus signs anymore. Uh, is equal to, because I'm kind of neurotic about this stuff, I'm also going to flip that. Uh, and that's going to be equal to d f prime of k. All right, so I just moved the plus things over to the other side. Um, sorry. There. Does that look right? True. There. Boom. How, how about that? Alrighty. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, both of you. Um. All right. Okay. Yeah. That that makes sense. Okay. So then, um, let's interpret this. Okay. And remember that d d is one minus gamma s. F right. Okay. All right. So, um. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we're, we're actually, no, okay. If, if D was fixed, okay. Then I, I would be able to say that, um, this is, uh, fully characterizes what K is, but actually S is endogenous. Okay. But remember that our law of motion for S, I'll just rewrite it here is E times K minus tau S. Okay. And in steady state, well, that means that EK plus tau S, right? Which means that S is E over tau times K. So we could take that equation up here, plug it in over there and get, and actually get a proper equation only with K and certain parameters. Okay. Um, that equation is difficult to solve in a closed form, probably impossible, but, but it's an equation. Okay. So, uh, but let's, con let's concentrate on this one here and, and see what we can see. So imagine a world in which, um, we shut down the climate externality. Okay. And to do that, well, we can, we can, you could set E to zero, which means that there's no emissions. Okay. Um, which would mean that this term would disappear. Uh, and the carbon stock would not be zero. I mean, it would be, you know, pre-industrial levels, which is analogous to zero here. Um, and so D would be one. So we'd just be, we'd just be left with rho plus delta equals F prime of K, which is what we usually get. Right. So, when we shut down the carbon thing, we come back to what we usually get. This is a, this is our steady state capital equation. Okay. Um, but then we add in stuff. Okay. So first the damage that's, you know, that affects the marginal product of capital. Okay. So that's um, going to go in here. That's I think natural. Okay. And then the other thing is this sort of long-term component. Okay. Which it kind of says, uh, you know, so you, you, you do some, you get additional amount of capital that causes emissions E, which then causes damage gamma. Okay. And the damage is proportional, which is why you have enough of K there. Okay. And then you integrate that over time with this discount rate, because, you know, first of all, you have a discount rate. And second of all, the, that, that effect depreciates with tau, right? If you, if you put a little bit of carbon in the atmosphere, 
it it slowly fades away, right? And so that that depreciation rate tells you sort of how long does this damage effect last? Okay, so this goes into uh, your 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 equation characterizing capital because it affects the incentives of of the social planner, right? So so this is our this is the main additional term here, uh, right here. That that tweaks that incorporates this damage. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that you see, if you thought about this ex ante, as a social planner, um, you should only really care about E times gamma together, the product of E times gamma. Because whenever you, um, you whenever you emit stuff, okay, that causes carbon stock to go up, which has an effect on actual production, which is gamma. Okay, so you don't really, you don't care about the carbon stock directly. You don't look at it and say, oh man, the, there's a lot of carbon out there that just makes me sad. You you care about it in this world because it's effect on production, okay? Um, and so you would expect that only E times gamma would show up. And in fact, and indeed you see you know, E times gamma here. And over here you see gamma times S, but then S has an E inside it. So that's also E times gamma. So so you would only expect to see those conjoined together. Uh, and that's what you do in fact see here, okay? Um, yeah, and then... Uh, Yeah, I mean, um, it's not the most satisfying ending in the sense of you get the equation, you can solve for it if if, if you have, um, well, it's not analytic, okay, but you could solve for it, okay. Uh, but, you know, you, you get an answer, okay, you get you get something characterizing capital. And you can also see, you can show that, um, let's see, as a, let me draw a graph here. You, you can plot both of these things and do comparative statics. Okay, so the, uh, if you think about it, the, the left-hand side over here, and I'll call this the right-hand side, and remember this is one minus E gamma K over tau times F prime of K, all right? So, uh, the, but the, but the left-hand side, okay, is, starts as a function of k, starts at rho plus delta, and then goes up according to that production function of k. All right, so it's going to look like that, All right? <clears throat> That's your left-hand side. And then the right-hand side, um, well, without the damage 1 minus gamma s function, it's just it's the marginal product of capital, which is decreasing. OK, so that's good. Um, there's the damage, but that's also going to push it down. That's going to make it decrease faster. Okay, so so that's going to start kind of at infinity and then go down like this. Okay, so we know that there's no oh no we know that there's going to be a unique intersection point here, which will give us k star. Okay, and then from k star we can get back to s star and all the other good stuff. All right, um, we can even find x if we want. Um, so we know that's going to be the case, and then we can also say okay, well what happens if um, uh, gamma is higher. Okay, the the damage uh, or or e the, that's going to be equivalent. Okay, e gamma or e, e times gamma. If either of those is higher. Um, what's that going to do? Uh, that's actually going to push. I'll kind of draw. I'll just draw another curve. That's going to push our LHS curve up. No, that's not right. Let's think. So the LHS curve always starts at rho plus delta, but it'll go steeper if e gamma is higher, all right? And then for the right-hand side, okay, this is right-hand side here. Uh, for the right-hand side, if e gamma goes up, that's gonna push that curve down kind of uniformly, okay? And proportionally. So that's gonna look like this. That's pretty bad. That's not the worst, okay? Just gonna look like that. Both of those are pushing the intersection point to the left. Okay, this is like supply and demand graph style inference. Okay, so we're gonna go down to a, a lower level of capital, which is perhaps not surprising. Okay, so you know, the E gamma uh, increase either in emissions or the damage is gonna push down um, the, the capital stock. And uh, it's also gonna push down, well, no, okay. Then there's one point where you can get some daylight between E and gamma, which is that if gamma goes up, damage that's going to push down the capital stock and it's going to push down 
the carbon stock, remember, which is inferred from the capital stock because there's no gamma here, right? So the thing is worse, climate change is worse. Optimally, you're gonna have less capital and less carbon stock in equilibrium, okay? Uh, but an E actually is a little bit tricky because that pushes down capital because you wanna have less emissions, but actually the, the accumulation of carbon uh, is, is worse. And so that counteracts it. So K, K goes down when E goes up, but then E goes up itself. So the net effect is, is not clear. Okay, so that's a little bit ambiguous because um, you're responding to that, but then the effect is also counteracting the response. Okay, so um, yeah. All right, so so that's, you know, it's kind of complicated, but you know, it's solvable. Okay, you can get an answer. All right, and in fact, if you assume uh, yeah, if, if you do the alpha equals one case, which is always a bit, is, 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 is a bit dangerous oftentimes, the alpha equals one case would mean that F of K, let's say is, uh, let's, let's say there's some productivity parameter, AK. So it's like an AK model, if you recall that, uh, which means that F prime of K is equal to A. Okay. If you do that, um, you can actually solve, it becomes a linear equation because this is a k, this is just a, and that that means it's linear and capital on either side, and you can solve for capital, okay? Which is um, kind of interesting because uh, a, a normal uh, a normal a k model, if you had no climate externality, if you did this, if you took this approach, you get rho plus delta to be zero equals a right if, if you had no climate considerations okay which is not an equation in k so so when you go to alpha equals one usually things become a little goofy because you actually get continual growth if you remember that that homework we did a while ago with the linear production you get continual growth um here you dampen that actually because you have this feedback through the climate system right so you don't get continual growth because you get more and more damages and so you you still end up at some equilibrium okay so that's kind of interesting that it provides a sort of feedback uh, negative feedback there all right um so you can actually solve this in closed form if you assume alpha equals one and f, f of k is linear okay um yeah all right so that's that's pretty much it okay so that's that's kind of complicated all right um that would be on the more far end of difficulty for a midterm problem, I would say, or, or even a prelim problem, okay? Because it, it it's a it's a bit rocky in the middle, all right? So, um, but but it does give you an idea of one thing. It gives you an idea of things get complicated pretty pretty quickly, right? Um, and they get hard to solve pretty quickly, all right? But if you make the right assumptions, sometimes they work out, all right? You just have to know what those assumptions are, okay? You need to you need to go back and forth, to kind of reverse engineer things, oftentimes. Okay. Um, all right. So, okay. So that's, I guess that's it for that problem. Um, I didn't, yeah. Uh, I forget. I'm trying to remember what, what I, I mean, when I, when I wrote the problem for the midterm, I think I just asked you, give me the Hamiltonian, write down the Hamiltonian derive the the equations characterizing the solutions okay so that's that's an important step is is knowing how to translate from kind of a textual i mean i gave you the equations too but knowing how to translate from from a description of a model into a hamiltonian properly apply the rules for the hamiltonian that's the most important step in some sense uh then i'll then i say okay you know um impose steady state you know see what you can find in steady state just knowing you know what equations do i have at my disposal everything you know if we're in a sort of a, stat, a a world that converges to a fixed static numbers, then you know kind of the Lagrange multiplier should also converge to to numbers and hence have zero growth rate. And then all of your state equations, those have zero 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 out those laws of motions, lots of motion, um, and those are also at your disposal, like like this, you know, for the the carbon stock uh, here and so on. Okay, so. Um, Yeah, so just kind of knowing what equations you can bring in at what times is is is, is important too. All right. Um, okay, I think that's it. 
Any questions on that? Yeah. All right. Well, think about that. Um, go over those, you know, review problems. Okay. Yeah. Further, or if you have other questions, then we can talk about it next time too. All right. So, so don't hesitate to ask. All right. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's hop on over to doing some computation. All right. Um, okay. So this is computation. Let's, let's make this bigger. Okay. So I'm in like a very confusing world in this new setup where there's like multiple mirrors of, women, of, of uh, windows and like it's I, I'm having trouble figuring out like what's real. What I'm saying is I'm at a hall of mirrors here. Um, and my window manager is, is not liking it. Okay, so all right. Okay, this is I think this is right. Okay. Um, okay, so what we're going to talk about today is Kind of the more, okay, so did you guys, I know you're busy, but you should get the, you know, get get comfortable with uh, either your, you know, install, own install of Python or a notebook and everything like that. Okay, so that's one goal. All right, because eventually we're going to start using this stuff. Okay, um, so do that. Um, yeah, and if you have any issues, just ask me or you, Chung, okay? All right. Uh, you can ask now. If, if you... Are people feeling good about that so far? Yeah. It's working? Yeah, just like, is it, you know, can you run basic stuff where, you know, these tutorials and stuff like that? That's that's where uh, where, where I think we, we want to be. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so then uh, I guess what I'm going to, what I'm going to over today is, is sort of this, this more, computational stuff relating to what we're doing, right? With uh, with kind of macro models, but also really any type of structural model. Okay, so if you, you know, this would, everything I'll do here applies perhaps even more so to uh, to structural micro kind of stuff, all right? Um, and then, yeah, so, so that's what we're gonna go over. Um, okay, so let me, Can, is it this isn't blurry too blurry or anything like that? Are we, are we feeling good about that? Okay. Okay. Um on the iPad, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. So there's okay. Yeah, there's there's probably about a second or so, I think, uh lag on, on this one. So okay. Um all right, so I'll, I'll I'll try and keep things under control here. All right, so um yeah, so a lot of this so this is this is number three. Okay, this is the third uh, chapter, if you will, or whatever um, uh, on that the the so called data science tutorial. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is sort of like numerical stuff. Okay, and so some of it you've seen before. Okay, so NumPy is sort of the core. Pandas, well, we didn't really go over it that much, but it's it's um. I don't even think we use it here, actually. It's sometimes useful just for general stuff, too. Uh, SciPy. SciPy is just, like, on top of NumPy. It's, like, you know, interpolation. You can see optimization. It brings in um, some of those more advanced functions, okay? Um, and then uh, Matplotlib for plotting. Okay, so this is all pretty standard stuff we've seen before. Okay, I'm going to run it. Um, this is just the configuring... Um, the, the the plotting okay you can you can actually not you can ignore most of this stuff if you want and it'll still basically work it'll just look slightly different on the on the plots okay um okay so but but uh let's talk about kind of like what what the approach is here okay so so the first thing i would do is is this ram computing stuff in the ramsey model okay so um so there as i've alluded to in the past uh you know it, it's an unstable system okay so you know one approach is to uh is to, to characterize it as choosing c0 okay so you choose c0 
you map all those equations forward and you see where you end up. And if you end up at steady state, which is to say you've satisfied your, which is kind of implied by satisfying your transversality condition. If you end up at steady state, then you're all good. Okay. Uh, the problem is that this is sort of like the shooting method, as I call it. Um, the problem with this is that it's, it's very hard. If you off a little bit on the initial C zero, you're going to diverge in either direction. Okay. Um, and we'll see that. Okay. So the solution actually is to reverse time back to the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you reverse time, it ends up being stable so that you start around your steady state. Okay. Um, but not exactly at your steady state, but just a little bit off of it. And you'll actually trace out the, uh, the stable arm and you'll even converge to the stable arm. So if, even if you're a little bit off of the stable arm, which in a variable you will be, you'll converge very quickly to that stable arm. And so you do the sort of the negative side and the positive side, you kind of paste those together and that gives you your full stable arm. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'm doing here is, is well, defining depth sizes. Okay. So here we're, we're, we're approximating a continuous time, uh, process. Uh, and so you need to choose a time step, right. That you're going to move in because you can't move continuously in a computer usually. Right. So you're going to say, I'm here today. I calculate my differentials K dot and C dot, whether we're going forward or backward in time. Uh, and then I go that times Delta T. Okay. Um, that's the idea. So here, uh, well, okay. And then, yeah, the other thing is, so you can do that. You can just go a fixed Delta T and just keep moving throughout the space. Uh, sometimes it's good to have a variable Delta T if you want to make sure that you don't move too far. Okay. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're using the same Delta T for your K movements as your C movements. Okay. So, so I, I, I ended up doing a variable Delta T scheme here because I want to map out you know, almost uniformly the space uh, and not move too quickly. If you move too quickly, the approximations sometimes break down and you, you become potentially unstable or you move into to regions which are not good. Um, and so that's, it, it would work fine if you did a fixed delta th. I, this is just a little better. Okay, so that, that's kind of what that is. Um, we need to know what steady state is, okay? Because we're when we do the reversing of time, we are starting around steady state and then going backwards and mapping up. So to do that, you actually need to know where steady state is. And so that's why I'm computing these, you know, K, K steady state, I steady state, just for what we know about the model that we, we've computed analytically. Okay. Um, yeah. And it, uh, so it, I forget if I mentioned this in Jupyter, you can, in a Jupyter lab, you can, you can um, type out like a LaTeX, like if you type out row and then just press tab, it'll, it'll, uh, you can put in, you can input uh, Greek letters. Okay. So that's, I don't know, saves characters in screen space, right? So boom. Okay. Now, then we just, um, we need to, we actually don't need a capital grid right now. So just ignore that. Right. So, um, so, so here's what we're going to do is basically this, this function. Okay. It takes an initial point and then simulates uh, the Ramsey model. Okay. By implementing those K dot and C dot equations that we had. Um, it takes some arguments, uh, in particular, it takes a direction. Okay. So this, it'll, it'll go whatever direction you want. Okay. So you can go forward if you want with this function. In this case, we're going to be going backward. Okay. And that's the default default is to go minus one. Okay. And so when we move, we're going to multiply things by that direction. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's just iterating. It's a like start here, find the growth rates, implement those, go to the next point loop and keep doing that and see where you see where that path takes you. Okay. And so that's why I'm here. I'm calculating the growth rate of K growth rate of C given where we are in that space. Okay. And then I'm updating these proportionally. Okay. Um, there's some stuff. If you, if you, if you blow through zero, it just bails out because it's done at that point. If you, you know, on the K side, you will, you will go negative if you just keep going. And so at that point you're done basically. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so, and then it, it, it basically returns two arrays. Okay. Uh, the path in K space and the path in C space. Okay. So together those give you a path in, in two space. All right. In KC space. Um, okay. And so then, and then what I do here is I call that function. Okay. But remember we, we have to go up and down. Okay. So we start at KSS minus this P tall. So that, that I defined uh, to be one, 
10 to the minus 4, so a small number, basically. Okay, so k steady state minus just a little bit, epsilon, if you will. C steady state minus epsilon. So I'm going diagonally. I'm going because that's we know that the stable arm is a diagonal arm. And then ks k steady state plus epsilon, css plus epsilon. So we simulate in both directions, and that's going to give us the whole thing. Um, and then so that gives us these the, the lower path, the upper path. And then this concatenate function is just it takes two arrays and pastes them together into one big array. Okay. Now you do for it to make sense, you know, going down, you know, this is this is the resulting picture. Starting at steady state and going down is actually backwards in like visually visual case space. So you reverse the first one. Going up is going forwards in, in the sense we're going up in case space. So so you reverse the first one, concatenate it with the second one that's going to give you kind of the stable arm in order. Okay. Um, and that's, that's what I'm, well, it, that's basically what I'm putting here. I interpolated the line a little bit, but, but that's what it's, it's uh, going to look like. I could, um, well, I oh, know because I did, sorry, I should actually run things. Okay. Um, so that, that's what it's going to look like just plotting that steady state point and the interpolated line. Okay. I could, um, you give you the raw k back and c back like this, but there's so many of them. Those are little circles, but there's you know thousands of them, so it just looks like a fuzzy line. Okay, that's why I didn't. That's why I didn't uh, do that. But there, the, the the density is quite high, so we're not losing much by interpolating this. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's kind of how you would do it. Okay, you just kind of you reverse time. Loop through, keep applying the equations. It's just sort of uh, that. That's the, the 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 approximation of a continuous time process in this case. Um, okay. Now here, uh, this is okay. So so now I have another. The, remember the old the old thing was called the old function was called simulate Ramsey. Okay, that just does this discrete approximation using the standard Ramsey equations. Okay. Um, the other thing I that you can do, which kind of leverages um, Python's uh, flexibility in certain ways. How am I doing on time here? I'm almost out of time. Uh, the leverages Python's flexibility is with func with functions, you can pass around functions however you want in Python. And you can pass around functions as arguments to other functions, right? So think about the Ramsey world. You know, you have, you start at some capital level and you have the choice of what consumption you're going to do. Okay. Now, Ramsey in the optimum, is that stable arm. That stable arm tells you if I have this level of capital, I choose this level of consumption, okay? Now we've seen, there are other policy functions, right? So there's the solo one, right? You can say, well, if I have this level of capital, calculate my uh, output, k to the alpha, which is basically down here, and and then just um, invest a certain fraction of that. And since my consumption is, is this, one minus s, k to the alpha. So you can have different policy functions. So what this does is it says, well, Forget about optimality for a second. Just at some initial k zero, and for some policy function cf, just keep applying those. Okay, so it'll, it'll it, you know, you take k and c and set them to k zero, and that policy function at k zero, so cf of k zero, um, and then just loop through and keep applying cf of k, and using the the just the physical uh, law of motion for capital. Okay, so this is more general in the sense that you can give it the solo policy. You could give it the thing we computed here, the stable arm that we computed. You could give it that, which would give you the the correct Ramsey path. Okay, and then and then you here I'm I'm just doing kind of a couple different things. Okay, so what I'm doing here is uh, starting at some initial level of capital. Okay, the blue line is just the stable arm, which converges to say state. So the blue line is is well behaved. Okay, um, and that. Here I'm doing forward Ramsey. I'm giving it C Paul is the the interpolated stable arm that we we computed. Okay, so that's like the right thing, the optimal thing. All right. Um, here, see my names are not great. C Sol C Solo, right? This is doing Solo the second one, and that's in green. I think. Uh, yeah. So that's that's in green. Um, and that you know we start. Uh, actually much higher. Okay, it turns out whatever, for a reason, the solo is saying, you know, compute your output, look at the savings rate, do some consumption, and you're going to do this. And actually, if you look at solo, you don't end up in, um, 
for a, a random savings rate, there's nothing saying you're going to end up at the, the RANC steady state, right? You're going to end up at some other steady state. And in fact, you end up a, a little bit of a higher steady state over here. And it, it ends up converging somewhere, right? Because we know that solo converges. It just converges somewhere else, right? Um, if we had set S to perfectly match that steady state Ramsey savings rate, then we would have ended up in the same spot. We would have just taken a different path. Yeah, we would have taken a different path, but we would have ended up in the same spot. Okay, so it's just a different thing. Um, and then the last thing I do is uh, C0. Oh, the last thing I do is, is actually simulate so just to back up, when we compute the blue path, we keep going back to the stable arm, okay? Um, we keep going back to the stable arm to get us back on track because going forward in time is inherently unstable, right? The other thing you can do is use only the C0, you know, only the optimal C0 from Ramsey, and then just let everything go after that with, with with that forward simulation. And actually what you see is even if you use that optimum C0, you eventually diverge because that optimum C0 is off by one to the minus, you know, 10 to the minus six or seven, something very, very small, but those errors compound and you actually don't hit state state. You, you, you're, you look good for a while, but then things go haywire and you go off, with it, right? So you need to continually re-reference that policy function, the stable arm that we computed and push yourself back onto this path for that to work. Just, just computing from from only using that the optimal C zero, the numerical instabilities will will get you in the end. Okay, so that's really I think where you can see that how unstable this thing really is. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that. Here, um, yeah, this is some other stuff. This is this is basically computing the kind of plots that we would do in class where you have a stable arm, you have high and low capital, and you can see where all these paths go. And that's just using the simulate the simulation functions that we've built in. Okay, so um, yeah, so I guess I'm out of time. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I think you know. I mean, first of all, you know, you can see how how did the the instabilities and in Ramsey play out? How can you get around those? Um, and also, you can see a little bit of the flexibility of of being able to pass around functions as arguments in Python and reuse stuff. Okay, in in potentially elegant ways, um, and and how that can be useful. Okay, so so that's kind of what I just wanted to show you with that. Um, some exercise to do it. I mean, you don't, you, you guys have other stuff on your plate right now, but maybe sometime in the future, you can check out the doing a, a, a change in taxes. Um, so that's it for now. Uh, next time we're really going to do Jax. Okay. And Jax is really stepping into a more like a kind of a symbolic setting where we define our model symbolically. And we say, okay, compute the derivative of this, you know, you know, do this, but compile it faster, do this, but run it on the GPU or whatever. So, uh, it's pretty powerful. So, so I'll, I'll kind of talk about that stuff next time, but also we're going to review next time. So we'll, we'll again kind of split things uh, a little bit. Okay. All right. So that's all I got over time already. Okay. Um, I'll see you guys on Thursday and uh, yeah, have a good one.